guys, and welcome to Sunday's Mailbag. I am Mark Riley, and I am here with Mr. Dennis Zen. How are you, Dennis? Good, good. I'm filling in for Perry. She's on a top secret mission this weekend. <laughs> That's right. Perry is somewhere, parts <laughs> unknown. We are not going to say where. Uh, she might be down looking for Pennywise, for all I know. That's how Perry does it. Lately, at least, with it. All right, you guys, you know what to do. You send us your questions to at, it's a, at collidervideo at gmail.com. We pick some, we answer it. That's the show. It's Sunday. We got five here, and we're going to go right to the first one. So here we go. Christian writes, greetings and salutations, Collider crew. Hopefully a fun question for you. Let's say you went to an alternate universe circa 1950s through 2000 where all the current day directors now reside instead. You already know the movies that came out during those years, but now you have to assign new directors. What directors would you be interested in seeing tackle some classics? Not saying replace what existed, hence the alternate universe. So for example, I would be curious to see what Edgar Wright version of Back to the Future trilogy looked like, or a Guillermo del Toro monster squad. Life's a garden, dig it. And I dig this question, Christian. This is a great question. And I have so many thoughts, but I want to start with you, Dennis. What would you do in this situation? Maybe not replace the movies yeah, that we already exactly, have. Yeah, exactly. But it's, it's a, like a what if. Yeah, it's very hard to do. I mean, I'm going to start off with my favorite uh, horror movie, which is The Shining. I don't want to Ooh. replace Kubrick's. Right. It, you know, it's, it's a masterpiece. It is. Um, but I would love to see uh, Darren Ar Aronofsky's take on that. Um, even though, you know, I just saw Mother, I had mixed feelings about it, but, you know, it, it, his other movies like Black Swan and Noah and, and uh, The Wrestler, he, he's able to get into the mind of someone, and I yeah. think that's where he would shine in something like The Shining. Oh, that's pun, a, pun, pun intended. Pun intended. Yeah. Okay, I was going to be like, bazinga! Yeah. Like it. That's a great one. I would I would want to see that as well. Uh, I mean, The Wrestler, you got Requiem for a Dream. Yeah. Like the, These are movies that are phenomenal, and I love The Shining so much. I want to see that. I'm going to go topical. We got Andy Muschietti doing It. Mm -hmm. I want to see him... Uh, do Nightmare on Elm Street. Okay. I, I, I'm going horror as well because I think he pulled off such good things with It and Pennywise and there was a lot of, he even said he thought about putting uh, Freddy Krueger into It oh, right. because It can take the... Like the, as the, a cameo? Yeah, it, it takes the shape of what uh, you fear in, in the original book, sets it in the 50s so you had the universal monsters, it would mm. become the Wolfman, Dracula, mm. that kind of thing. And he toyed, because it is New Line Cinema, he toyed with just a shot of the glove mm. taking the shape of something because it's now set in the 80s. There's even a, a little Easter egg of Nightmare on Elm Street Part 5 is playing in theaters in Derry at the time. Okay. So it could have worked. But I like straight up Andy Muschietti, Nightmare on Elm Street. But man, I got to give credit. Guillermo del Toro doing Monster Squad. I want that now. In fact, remake it and bring Guillermo in. I will see that. That sounds fantastic to me. I can also see uh, Steven Spielberg doing It's a Wonderful Life. Oh, that's just, a good one. Just because he, 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 he's one. great at doing the sentimentality, and that's a movie that's very sentimental. I think he could do that. Uh, and I know who he's casting, too. Yeah. Well, come on. Who's the, who's the modern day, you know, Jimmy, yeah. Jimmy Stewart? It's, uh, it's Tom Hanks. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. I love that. And I, I, I was trying to get a Jaws reference in, like mm -hmm. what would be a director that would do Jaws right now? And you still have Spielberg kicking ass, so yeah. you're not going to change that. Just for shits and giggles, though, who could do a Jaws movie it, with today's directors, not in, including Spielberg? I'm not thinking of anything. I'm, put, I'm putting it to you right now while I think. Who would do Jaws? Oh, I know, right? Someone that can capture that kind of impending doom. Right. That I don't know. Fear, that uh, paranoia. I got it. Who? Denis Villeneuve. Ooh. Denis Villeneuve doing a Jaws movie. That would be something. It would be beautifully shot, and there would be a lot of character depth just going deep inside the mind of Brody. And then we flesh out Quint a little bit more, and we see him doing a lot of crap. I mean, these are, I, I could go on for days. This yeah. is some crazy stuff here. No? Anything else? Any yeah. other directors? No, I mean, I mean, there's so many. It's that you so could, hard. You can choose from, but then at the same time, it's hard because you're thinking of classic movies that you really don't want to change, but at the same time, you'd like to see, it, like he says, an alternate version. He gave us the easy way out. We're not yeah. replacing them. We're not replacing. We're, we're seeing an alternate version. It's the Marvel one shot. It just happens once, and then will never happen again. But another shout out, Edgar Wright, 
Back to the Future, that's something special too. Yeah. That would be amazing. Do not remake these things. We're not saying that. These are just alternate dimensions. Yeah. All right, let's move on to our second question. Juho writes, I hope it's Juho. Uh, Hello, Collider crew. I love your channel and watch it every day. Considering the hugely positive response to Bill Skarsgård's performance as Pennywise, could he be the perfect choice for the role of the Joker in the new Martin Scorsese-produced Joker movie? Keep up the good work. Best regards. Ever since it came out and killed it, I've seen a ton of he should play the Joker mm -hmm. in the Martin Scorsese one. And while I think Skarsgård did a fantastic job as Pennywise, one clown does not make another clown. I just, I mean, we're typecasting. And yes. I, I think that he's great, but the thing that's great about Pennywise is that you, you don't know a lot about Pennywise. You haven't, have you seen it yet? I no, can't remember. No. Okay. So it, it, it's, it's hard to really go into it. I mean, if you know the book, you know about Pennywise. Pennywise is not just the clown. So Skarsgård has something. He has a twinkle in the eye doing Pennywise, but I don't think it transfers to the Joker. Mm -hmm. I want to see somebody else. Now, I know Leonardo DiCaprio was mentioned in a THR article. He's not going to do it. Mm -hmm. um, but there are a lot of really great actors out there that I would look to before Skarsgård. I, I would like to personally see Skarsgård out of clown makeup and see what else he could do. Because I've, I was not aware of anything that Skarsgård did before Pennywise. So all I had was Pennywise. And he was fantastic. He, he killed it. But I want to see something more now. I don't. I don't need to see him as another clown. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think the typecasting thing is a big concern, especially yeah. from his his point of view. It's like I don't want to be known as just the clown guy. Yeah. Though, you know, playing someone as a, a iconic villain as like the Joker is hard to pass up. Being part of a Martin Scorsese production is very hard to pass up. Yeah. But ultimately, I think it's in his best interest to to go away from that. And you know. Every, people know his name, but they really, you know, with all the clown makeup, it's not like they know his face. Right. So I think he needs to get out there and do something different. Yeah, that's my vote rom -com too. Rom-com or something like that. Yeah, <laughs> rom-com or a drama or, a, you know, a Spielberg movie if he can do it. I don't know. But yeah, let's, I, I, I'd like to see somebody. It, it's really hard to cast the Joker now when we have such a new version in Jared Leto. I just don't really, I thought, I wanted to see more from him because mm -hmm. Suicide Squad was just, whatever. I didn't like it. I want to see more. We're going to have more options. I have no idea who they are going to cast in the origin story. That remains to be seen, but Skarsgård, yeah, do something else. But yeah, how can you say no? If Martin yeah. Scorsese goes, hey, do you want to be in my Joker movie? He'd probably say yes. Yeah. All right, let's move on to our third question. Luke writes, hi, Collider. Love what you do. You're the reason I flew from Sydney to Toronto TIFF this year and freaking loving it. Man, you're lucky. Uh, thanks for the inspiration. In a few films Q&As here, director George Clooney said an entire scene with Jeff Bridges was cut from Suburbicon, and Darren Aronofsky said Mother originally had a score by Johan Johansson, which was later cut, so the film had no score at all. That's interesting. With both of these decisions, I trust the directors. Mother was hauntingly creepy in tone with just sound design, but it made me wonder. How often do chunks of films just get dropped, especially taking two-time Oscar winner scores out? Or what sounded like a hilarious scene from seven-time Oscar-nominated Jeff Bridges? Those seem like crazy big shifts that happened during editing. That's interesting. Why would you take these Oscar winners out? What, what, why in the world would you do something like that? I have my answer. Dennis, what do you think? Well, I mean, definitely everything needs to service the movie. So... You know, it, it doesn't happen often. First of all, the, the small changes happen all the time. Yeah, oh yeah. Thing, in the editing room, things get cut. Plenty of scenes get cut. But if you're talking about big, big shifts, you're talking about uh, something, you know, uh, in that movie, Her, that Spike Jones did. Mm. They completely replaced Samantha Morton's voice oh. with Scarlett Johansson's voice. I didn't know that. Yeah, so oh. that, that's a significant difference, that's a right? Huge, yeah, They've yeah. already shot the movie. Yeah. You know, uh, Joaquin Phoenix has already done his part, probably reacted to Samantha's voice already. Yeah. So then when Spike Jones comes back and starts editing, he goes, oh, that voice just isn't right, you know? Yeah. Maybe it's not anything against the actor or actress, it's just it doesn't fit. Same thing happened with uh, Paddington Bear. They had, uh, I think, mm. Colin Firth was was supposed to do the voice, and they said it didn't match, and I forgot who they got, but they got someone else to, to yeah. do the voice. I remember Colin Firth, but yeah, 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 I don't remember who picked it up. Yeah, and so there's a lot of things that happen, but I, those big ones don't happen that often. Yeah, it, it, it is. You said it. It's the director's vision, first and foremost. So, you know, 
and, and we're talking about some some big directors here, so they, you know, they can throw their weight around. They can cut out Jeff Bridges. They mm -hmm. can decide that they don't want to score. They were all paid for their time, but it's the movie. I mean, it's like, listen, we're gonna, it's gonna serve us a story. And you know, Jeff Bridges, though he's Jeff Bridges, I'm sure he's not going. Well, listen, George, I disagree, and you need to keep me. Maybe he did. But again, at the end of the day, it's always the director. Now, let me pose it this way. What if it's like a first-time director or a second-time director and they're working with A-list talent and that director goes, you know what, I want to cut you out. Do you think that A-list star can get in there and... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. See, it goes both ways, doesn't it? Yeah, and also the studio themselves, too. Yeah. They, they don't want to see their A-list actors cut out of anything. You right. Know? It's only when you get to that higher level where you're like, okay, well, we don't need this, we don't need that. Yeah. And then the studio trusts them and says, okay, you know, like if Chris Nolan says, I want to do this or that, the studio is going to trust them and, right. and let them do it. It, it. Exactly. And, you know, and by the time you get there and you, you look at these icons now, both behind the camera and front of the camera, and they get together, there's a mutual respect of each other for their artist, artistry and their vision. So, you could see a collaboration happening where, you know, even like a smaller example and a more politically charged example is Ed Screen dropping out of Hellboy. Mm -hmm. He decided, you know what, it's not right for me for the greater good of the community mm -hmm. and the vision of this material and to honor the source material, I'm gonna step away. And that was an interesting thing that was done. That guy turned down a job mm -hmm. for the good of the production and the good of creating something positive in this now diverse client, uh, uh, what am I saying, climate of movies. So that's one example, small, different, but Jeff Bridges, I could see having a, a, a martini with George Clooney and go, yeah, man, I get it. I get yeah, it, yeah. you can cut me out, that's fine. And same with uh, Aronofsky deciding, especially a bold choice of not having music. I didn't yeah. know, there's no music in Mother? It's like uh, no no film I music? Don't, I don't remember any, yeah, but there at you the same go. time, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's pretty, intense movie so you're not paying attention to that well yeah and especially you know and with Johan Johansson he did and I, I'm probably butchering his name he did a rival he worked with Denis Villeneuve mm -hmm. and so that he was obviously a, has his chops he has his chops but he also like his music in Arrival was very kind of mood setting it mm -hmm. wasn't as much as music and themes that stuck out for me it was more like enhancing the sound design. It felt almost like a part of the atmosphere that they were uh, like walking in, especially in the spaceship. So it's interesting. It's a great question, but it always mostly comes down to these great directors who make that call. So, all right, let's move on. Number four, Jed writes, thanks for taking my question. Do you think that DC could use the Flashpoint movie to recast some less popular portrayals like Lex Luthor or the Joker? Thanks for taking my question and keep up the great work. Yeah, I think that's the going theory now, is that we've had a lot of, I mean, we've covered, I mean, Ben Affleck, okay? I mean, we know that Ben Affleck, something's going on there. Whether you agree or disagree, or call people DC haters or Marvel lovers or whatnot, listen, where there's smoke, there's fire, Ben Affleck, something's going on behind the scenes with Ben Affleck as Batman. So for all we are hearing, we might get a different Batman going forward. We don't know yet if Matt Reeves' Batman is existing in the DCEU or outside the new spinoffs mm -hmm. because I've read conflicting reports. I don't know what to expect. So I'm just kind of, I'm, I'm waving the white flag and I'm going, hey, I'll just see it when I believe it in regards to Batman. But to answer your question, hell yes, recast Jesse Eisenberg. If you can, that, listen, Batman v Superman, I enjoyed the hell out of. I liked the, the, the expanded cut more, mm -hmm. but it was on HBO the other day, and I started watching it, and it just, I remember not hating Jesse Eisenberg's portrayal. In fact, I thought it was a bold move to cast him and to do something like that. I thought was was very interesting, but now that I've seen the movie, that was probably my fourth time watching it on mm -hmm. HBO. It it grounded it to the st to a stop for me. I literally, it was, and it was a scene where Jesse Eisenberg was on the roof talking to Superman and telling him what's going on with his mom and Lois Lane and Batman and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, one of these kids is doing his own thing, man. Mm -hmm. and, it, and I didn't like it. So can Flashpoint do that? The answer is yes, I think it can. And I think they could. And I think, wow, that somebody's <laughs> phone is really loud and ringing somewhere here. Can you all hear that? Yeah. yeah? Hope they pick it up. Um, so. It, it, it's an interesting thing to think about. What do you think about Flashpoint getting rid of some of the other DC less yeah. popular things? I mean, with Lex Luthor or the Joker, I think it's less of a risk because 
there was a mixed reaction. I don't think I hated uh, Jason, Jesse Eisenberg's portrayal of Lex Luthor as much as other people did, but I understand that there's a lot of people who did, mm -hmm. and with the Joker, people were lukewarm about that. I, 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 I didn't mind it. But Me neither. I thought he was decent. I just didn't like the movie he was in. The movie <laughs> but if they change them up, yeah, I think that's less risky. But let's say they just want to go all wholesale, like, all right, we're going to change Joker, Lex Luthor, Batman. Right. What about Superman? The thing is, you can't just leave one, right? You can't be like, well, we're going to keep Henry Cavill. We're going to change Ben Affleck. We're going to change uh, Jesse Eisenberg. We're going to change Jared Leto. They yeah. can't do just... You know, everyone but one guy, they gotta do it all. And I don't know. And then you have Gal Gadot, who's very popular yeah. as Wonder Woman. So yeah. it's tough. It's tough. I, I don't know if they're gonna use use Flashpoint in that regard to help to, to recast. But if they decide to recast something like they did with um, Katie Holmes in in uh, from uh, Batman Begins the Dark Knight. That might be an option. Personally, that's my way to do it. You know, I know that especially now where everything is like, is it canon, is it canon, is it, you know, is it a shared universe, you have to have this person, this person. You know, as you saw, your, your reference with Batman Begins to The Dark Knight, I was okay with it, I just yes. went with it. You just kind of go, yep, yeah, different actors, you know, perfect. I can do the same with Batman, honestly. If they just decide to recast Batman, and then all of a sudden we have, say, Army Hammer mm. show up as Batman, and he's standing next to Henry Cavill and Gal Gadot, great, I'd be fine, I'd be like, cool. I, uh, that one I would I feel weird about just because he's so much younger than that. Happened. Yeah, that Army Hammer is yeah. probably a bad example. I'm going off. He's always rumored for yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, oh yeah, his, he's Green Lantern. That's the rumor. Yeah. I don't know who you'd get for, um, you know, uh, uh, another Batman that's that's Ben Affleck. I mean, I, I personally hope he doesn't. I wish I wish they could work it out. I wish they could like send muffin baskets to each other and work <laughs> this out. Just a big muffin basket and go. Can we talk? Because Ben Affleck is one of the best Batman, in my opinion. As far as but your, your other your other choices, yeah, we will see with Flashpoint. I'm actually reading the comic again, oh, nice. you know, because it was so, it's so great, and to see what they're doing. And I know a lot of people look to um, Jeffrey Dean Morgan mm -hmm. because Batman's dad is in Flashpoint. Um, that he would be fascinating. Also played the comedian in the Watchmen. And he played watch comedian watch in the Watchmen. <laughs> so it's all interesting. I know you guys are are waiting as we are for the actual official news on what's happening with Batman and Flashpoint, but we will wait and see. Yeah, that, uh, they're going to wait until after Justice League. Yeah. If, I, if there is any type of announcement, they're going to wait a few months after Justice League. Yeah, we got to see how, how well Justice League does in theaters, critically, box office, because that, yeah, we don't know. So we'll wait and see, and you'll join us with us, won't you? Ha <laughs> ha. Here we go, last question. We got Kent. Kent writes, Dear Collider, Hi, I love watching you guys every day. Best crew ever. Thank you. My question is, since recently IT has shattered box office records after uh, banging a massive total of $123 million during opening weekend like no other horror movies before, where do you guys think IT will end at its box office run? Is it possible they'll end somewhere around $700 million, $800 million, or even higher? Thanks for picking my question, and best wishes. It's a good question, and I read something a couple days ago that Fandango said second weekend t tickets for it are at an all-time high. It's mm. really, it's picking up steam and it doesn't look like it's going away. So I think a 700 million, 700 million is not a bad number to think about is mm. actually happening. I don't know, some people have already been tagging me on Twitter going, do you think it'll make a billion? I, I don't know about a billion. I don't think a billion. Seven, yeah, I would go on the lower end of 700 million. It opened, I mean, look, domestically, it took in 123. World, uh, overseas, it took in about, I think it was 60 million. Yeah, I think that's what, I have a six to, 600 to 700 million worldwide. I think yeah. just because this isn't gonna translate as well internationally, like you're talking about some of the superhero movies or mm -hmm. some of the big blockbuster movies that like, they open very big and overseas where I think this is not going to hit as well overseas and it's going to do great. Yeah. Here, um, domestically, I think it'll easily pass 200 million. We'll see how far that goes. Right, right. And, you know, I always do the litmus test. That is my mother. She sees everything. She's not going to see it. Mm -hmm. It's just too scary for her. And there are a lot of people, especially on Twitter as well, 
when the Josh McCuga thing was happening yeah, yeah, yeah. and like, I'm gonna go see it and I'm forcing him to see it. Look, Josh McCuga would not go see that movie unless he was forced, yes. which we did. Um, so there are gonna be people, horror people, uh, the, the horror fans and the diehard IT fans and the diehard book fans, nostalgia from the IT miniseries. That's why you saw this big number. I think there was a lot of people that went opening weekend. Yeah. All those people, that's why you saw all of that. But there are his, uh, history. There are horror people, uh, non-horror people, that aren't going to touch this movie. and So when you think about a Star Wars or a Marvel or a DC, something that's crossed a billion or, a, yeah. or like Spider-Man Homecoming right now, which just reached 800 million worldwide, these are movies that everybody can see. Yeah. Everybody will go see it and it's a big event movie. This is a very specific genre, so I think because of that, you're not going to hit 700 or not even a billion. So. What were, you, what were you saying again? I said, 500, I 600? said 600 to 700. 600 so, to 700, I yeah. I think Conjuring did four something. Yeah. So, you know, I'm just thinking this has, you know, a little more appeal because it's Stephen King or whatnot, but even still, like, internationally, I don't think it's going to blow up. Like, yeah. Like something like you're saying, even Spider-Man, you're saying even that's, like, what, crossing 800, and mm -hmm. that's Spider-Man. Everyone that's, knows Spider-Man. That's Spider-Man. Yeah. Exactly. I agree with you. I, I'm going to hover in between 600 and 700 as well. I think that's a good number to hit, and we'll wait and see uh, as the second uh, second week of numbers come in from it, because if it's through the roof again, maybe we'll adjust yeah, yeah. our estimates. Yeah. Who knows? But. All right, guys, that's his last question for this Sunday's mailbag. Thanks for joining us, and as always, send in your questions at collidervideo at gmail.com. We will pick some, and we will do these great shows. So, Dennis, where can the people find you? You guys can find me on Twitter, at ThinkHero, Instagram, Dennis.TCNG. And uh, you can find me at Riley around on Twitter and Instagram. Guys, send in your questions. Like I said, drop in some comments below. What did you think about our answers? Mm -hmm. Do you disagree? Do you think it's going to go a billion? Do you want to see Flashpoint just rewrite all the parts? We want to hear from you. And make sure you share this video. Share it to your friends. We do a lot of this. and We'd love to see those videos out there. And that would be great to see everybody talking about these questions that you send in. So until then, we'll see you next time. <laughs>